Determined but forlorn, the women trudged up the pathway toward the Garden of Tombs, laden with spices to anoint the body of Jesus who had been so suddenly and cruelly taken from them. They were still processing the shocking events that had taken place. They couldn't understand why the chief priests would want to have him executed, a man who had helped so many, who had shown such love, who had healed the sick and even raised the dead. No doubt their minds were filled with questions. But as they drew near the tomb, uppermost was the question of how they would move the stone from the tomb entrance. But when they arrived, they were shocked to find the stone had already been rolled back. That was the first surprise. Next, they were astonished to discover Jesus' body was gone. Even more puzzling was the fact that the grave clothes were still lying there. Then they were startled, terrified at first, when gleaming angels appeared. But perhaps most shocking of all was the question the angels asked them. Why do you look for the living among the dead? The women went to the tomb to look for the body of Jesus in order to anoint it with burial spices. In the rush to entomb his body before the Sabbath began, there had not been time to properly anoint the body with spices. This was done to keep down the smell of a decaying body since the Jews didn't embalm. It was also a means of showing respect and honor to the deceased. However, now they were informed that Jesus was no longer there because he was alive. Then the angel reminded them that Jesus had predicted his resurrection on the third day. And that was the reason the angel asked them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? The angel's question suggests that the women should have realized Jesus wouldn't be in the tomb any longer. They should have known that he would be alive. Why? Well, because he had told them several times. The first time he specifically predicts his death and resurrection took place when he took the disciples on a retreat to Caesarea Philippi. There Peter declared, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus told his disciples, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Matthew points out that from this time on, Jesus began explaining to his disciples about his death and resurrection, suggesting this was an ongoing teaching. The second time the Gospels record this prediction specifically was immediately after the transfiguration. Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John up a mountain with him where he was transfigured and met with Moses and Elijah. And there Jesus spoke with them about his departure. After returning to the rest of the disciples, he healed a demon-possessed boy and then later said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Matthew points out that this filled the disciples with fear and grief, while Luke adds that they didn't understand and were afraid to ask about it. The third recorded prediction came as they traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus tells his disciples plainly, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. The Gospels also suggest that Jesus talked about his mission and purpose regularly with his disciples, and it seems with increasing clarity and frequency as his time drew closer. He also alludes to it when Mary of Bethany anointed him with perfume at a dinner held in his honor after he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And then at the Last Supper itself, Jesus reminded his disciples that his time was short, that he was going away, but that he would send the Holy Spirit so they wouldn't be orphans. Certainly these women, some of whom traveled regularly with Jesus and the disciples, would have heard some of these predictions, and they would have 
heard the ongoing discussions they must have generated among the disciples. And so the angel asks them, why do you look for the living among the dead? These devoted women have been devastated and grief-stricken by the terrible death Jesus died. In the horror and turmoil of all these events, they did not remember his teaching and hadn't really grasped what he had prophesied. But perhaps we, lest we're too harsh on these women and the disciples, are we not guilty of looking for the living among the dead as well? Oh, we realize Jesus is alive. We know intellectually that he rose from the dead and holds the keys to death and hell. But sometimes we don't seem to look, live like it. Do we look for the living among the dead? The women came to the tomb, the place of the dead, looking for the body of Jesus, hoping to pay their respects, planning to anoint his body, and perhaps gain some solace and comfort through their devoted efforts. But Jesus was not there. The tomb could not provide hope, but the one who is the resurrection and the life could. The tomb would not fill them with peace, but the Prince of Peace would. The tomb could not empower for living, but the I am, the one who is life itself, could empower. Jesus is alive. He is not among the dead, nor is he among the lifeless idols of this world, nor is he to be found in the pursuits of this world. The people of this world look for the living among the dead. That is, they seek to find life and meaning in the dead and decaying things of this world. John writes in his first letter, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. How often are we tempted to look for the living or for life in the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life? Solomon describes how he sought the living among the dead. That is, he looked for meaning and purpose in many things outside of God. He acquired wealth, he possessed power, he sought prestige, he ran after pleasure, but none of these things gave life. None brought meaning, none provided hope. Sure, they gave satisfaction for a time perhaps, but they didn't bring lasting peace. They didn't engender fulfillment. They didn't give hope. They didn't fill with love. They didn't satisfy the, the need for meaning. They didn't endow with lasting purpose. Rather, they left him empty. Solomon states, so I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Oh, what a depressing observation. Solomon is speaking oh, about life without God, a life of seeking the living among the dead. And there was no hope. Everything was meaningless. But at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon does conclude that the only way to find meaning in life, the only means of hope and peace is to seek the living God. And so he advises that we remember your creator in the days of your youth. Fear God and keep his commandments. Solomon discovered that the living God was not found in the dead pursuits of this life. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And how about us? How often are we guilty of seeking the living among the dead? How often do we approach the tombs of this world, hoping our spices might do something to soothe our desperate souls? Are we guilty of seeking the living, seeking life and fulfillment in the possessions of this world? 
I mean, the world tells us we need the latest gizmo, the most up-to-date technology, the latest fashion, the newest car. But will any of those things really satisfy? Now, Jesus didn't condemn possessions or wealth. He had wealthy friends, some of whom helped fund his ministry. But he did say we shouldn't worry and strive over such things. Jesus remarked that God feeds the birds and clothes the flowers, and if he does that, we can trust him to provide for us also. Worrying about and striving after such things will not bring us life or peace. Rather, Jesus told us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then God would provide for all that we need. Zacchaeus was a man of wealth. He gained some of it by abusing his possession as a tax man and cheating others. But though he had money, he didn't have hope. While he was wealthy, he did not possess peace. While he had friends, he hadn't found love. And though he had abundant possessions, he didn't have life. Then he met Jesus, the living one. In him he found life, and his wealth mattered little any longer. So he made restitution to those he cheated and gave half his wealth to help the poor. So the angel asks, why do you seek the living among the dead? Oh, let us not seek life among the dead possessions and wealth of this world. But do we seek the living among the dead pleasures of this world? I mean, we live in an unprecedented time of pleasure seeking. Our society pursues pleasure and fun like never before. Nothing is considered wrong as long as it doesn't harm others. While this past year has put the brakes on some things, we long for pleasures and fun, whether real or virtual, whether it be the latest roller coaster ride, you know, bigger, faster, more thrilling than ever, perhaps a thrilling white water rafting experience or an amazing zip line course. For others, they dive into the party scene, getting drunk and high and pursuing sexual experiences in hopes that such things will bring joy and peace. And many, and perhaps even some of us, only pursue such things virtually through stories told in books or portrayed visually in movies or TV shows all in the hopes that such escapes will give us some life in the dead-end experience of living. Now, not all these things are wrong in themselves. Possessions and pleasures will not give life, though. Jesus said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The angel asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? The women who went to the tomb had just seen Jesus crucified and buried. They were still processing the horror of it all. So even though Jesus had told them multiple times that he would die and then rise on the third day, perhaps they could be excused for seeking the living among the dead. But what excuse do we have? We have the written word of God that tells us Jesus is alive. God tells us that the things of this world are passing away. The Bible illustrates that the pleasures we pursue, the possessions we strive to accumulate, the power we try to gain and exercise over others, the positions we work for, the prestige we seek, all will leave us empty and lifeless in the end. Jesus is risen. He is alive. Jesus, the living one, gives life. When the angel asked the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? He was telling them and us, don't seek for comfort, hope and peace and joy and life from the dead things of this life, of this world. Go to Jesus who is alive forevermore. Jesus will give you those things. Our life is in Christ. He took our sins upon himself so that we could have hope. He bore the Father's wrath so that we could have peace with God. He endured the shame and agony so we could have joy. 
He faced separation from the Father so we could be adopted into God's family. He conquered death so that we could have life in him. Oh, let us pursue Jesus first and foremost. May we not let the dead things of this world distract us from getting to know Jesus who is alive. May we not stumble around in the dark tombs of this world trying to find consolation and hope, but rather look to Jesus who is the light. May we not try to feed our souls on the bread of pleasure when Jesus, the bread of life, offers us what will truly satisfy. May we not follow the wide path of destruction, but follow the good shepherd on the narrow path that leads to life. Let us not seek the living among the dead, but invite Jesus by his Holy Spirit to appear to us daily as we feed upon him in his word, the Bible, as we commune with him in prayer, as we enjoy fellowship with one another, as we worship him. Oh, do we really believe Jesus is alive? Then let us seek him above all. God bless you.